Uh, first of all, I'd like to ask everyone to put your phones on silent. Also, the time is 5.31. I'd like to call the LINDOP school board meeting to order. Can I get a roll call? For President Grissom. Present. Board Member Alexander. Present. Board Vice President Hannah. Present. Board Member <clears throat> Dawson. Yes, he'll be late. Board Member Morris. Present. Board Secretary Taylor. Present. Board Member Williams Wolford. Absent. Okay, everyone is, we have a quorum. Uh, next, we'll have the Pledge of Allegiance. If everyone would stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. If we could just observe a moment of silence. Thank you. Next, we'll have our spotlight on success. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. So we have some stellar students here from grades six, seven, and eight, and they're going to tell you about ZSpace, a program that they use in their classroom. So first we have Mr. Michael Keller. Hi, my name is Michael Keller, and I am in sixth grade. Today I will be talking about ZSpace. ZSpace is an advanced 3D computer. That can be that can be controlled by that can be controlled by pen or keyboard. You could see it by using by using glasses that comes with it, and also yeah. also I like Z space because. You get to see out a point of view that you can never normally see it. Thank you for buying Z-Space. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is Javon. Yeah, I'm in seventh grade. I think the Z-Space machine is excellent for a classroom. Exactly. For classrooms because it is a fun. A full way to learn STEM uh, subjects in school. We, I get to experience new things in 3D. Thank you. Hi, my name is Cassandra, and I'm an eighth grader here at Lindop. And I'm going to tell you why most of my classmates enjoy using the Z space. It is a 3D machine, so when we put on the glasses, the 3D is it is a 3D image. Uh, we also like using it because it goes more into depth on such subject, subjects such as photosynthesis. We were also able to break things apart such as the sun, the chloroplast, and the cell membrane. My class my my classmates enjoy using it very much. Oh, no. Good evening. My name is Kamaya Mister, and I am an eighth grader here at Linda, and I'm here to talk about why I enjoy ZSpace. I enjoy ZSpace because it allows a visualization for those who have a hard time comprehending the topics. It is very used and it gives is very it is very fun to use, and it gives the best experience for the for my classmates. It is very easy to use and not too complex. And with a teacher like Mr. Son, she explains it very well. Overall, C space is a very useful technology to use in the classroom. And we thank you for purchasing it for our students. And on Board Docs, there should be a video of students using Z space so you're able to see them with the 3D computer. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Very interesting. I guess I'll go. Questions? I don't have a question. I just have a really, um, and just a small comment. From Michael on, you guys did an amazing job. Michael, you set the tone. You did not want to read off your index <laughs> cards. And I commend you all for that. They, they were very proud to tell us what ZSpace was. And as a board, we really appreciate you guys. You did an awesome job. So don't, I see heads down over there. Lift those heads up because you guys did an amazing job. Exactly. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, are there any public comments? Yeah, no. Okay. Um, for your request. Yes, good evening, uh, Board of Education, community members, faculty, and staff. Uh, we do have another FOIA request, and this is one that pretty much comes out like every other month, asking for the information about our vendors and who we utilize. Uh, the FOIA request has been satisfied. Thank you. Upcoming events and correspondence. Madam President, we have none tonight. Thank you. Uh, the items that are listed, we would ask everyone to read their handouts. Next, we'll have the consent agenda. Can I get a recommendation to approve LENDOT payroll? Is it a demo? Excuse me, can I get a motion for the board to approve Lindox payroll? So everything that's one through six? Yes. You can just say items one through? Items one through six. Thank you. Thank you. All right, board vice president Hannah, I make a motion that the board approve Lindox District 92 payroll for December 20th, 2022 through January 16th, 20. 23 in the amount of $445,793.26 activity account reconciliation for December 2022. Lindop District 92 accounts payable for December 2022 through January 17, 2023 in the amount of $241,508.63. The regular open session meeting minutes for December 20th, 2022 and regular closed session meeting minutes for December 20th, 2022, and the first read and adoption of policies 2105, 2150, 2, 210, 2250, 2, 265, 3, 310, 5, 120, 5, 170, 5, 190, 5, 260, 5, 280, 620, 650, 660, 665, 6130, 6270, 6340. And the first read of policies 410, 4140, 4165, 520, 5220, 5250, 5320, 5330, 615, 6250, 6255, 6260, 750, 770, 7100, 7180, 7250, 7285, 7290, and 7340. Thank you. Cheryl Griffin, I'll second. Uh, is there a discussion? Okay, can we have a roll call? For President Griffin? Yay. For Vice President Hanna? Yay. For Secretary Taylor? Yay. For Member Alexander? Yay. For Member Dawson? Absent. For Member Morris? Yay. For Member Williams Wolford? Absent. Motion carries. Next, we'll have old business. The presenter will be Chris Scarlett, Evans, Marshall, Hayes, and Baraniak. Bark. <laughs> Baranic, thank you. Good evening, Board of Education, administrators, community members, and staff. Um, I did receive a late text from Chris Scullett that he was feeling under the weather. 
He was going to come and give the presentation. However, um, I do not want to have any germ spread in this particular gym with our board members and our community members with it. I asked him to reschedule for February. He will be on the books for February's meeting. He did apologize for it. Um, but like you said, I thought it was in the best interest of the district to reschedule the presentation due to him feeling under the weather. And he was deeply apologetic. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next we have a presentation on the state of the district. Good evening, Board of Education. Once again, we'd like to talk to you a little bit about some of the things we have been um, going through and making sure that we're giving you what you need, but also what our parents and students need um, at this time. And so if you look at the board and you also have a copy of this presentation as well, if you'd like to take a look at it, it should be right by your folders. And so we've talked to a total of 13, 13 meetings remain. There were 19 held. I uh, will tell you a little bit about those meetings during that meetings. We have a, uh, an opportunity to speak with parents. And this was something that uh, we should have been doing a long time ago because the parents have been amazing. And even when our uh, message has not been easy to digest for them, all of the parents have a way where they have direct access to everything that the children are receiving during the day. And also uh, they were given a guide and also something that they would be able to help their students with as they prepare for the IAR. Our children began taking map testing today. Um, a lot of them, the parents were um, shocked to see it, maybe some of the dips in the map scores. However, uh, when bringing the child in, that was uh, fixed pretty quickly. And so we don't have to worry about anyone just hitting buttons trying to get to the next question, but they're actually taking this extremely seriously. Um, I think that we have developed some relationships uh, in a deeper level because now they see exactly how we are caring for their children and uh, it has been eye-opening. I'll let Dr. Betts uh, talk about some of the information that was given to the parents so that they are able to hold us accountable, but also be able to advocate for their children. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. Um, one thing that really stands out is that there are no parents in this community who do not want their children to succeed. So inviting parents in to partner with us on academic success has actually been a really successful thing for us to be doing. So as Dr. Jackson said, definitely something to note and to keep moving forward on. Um, but what we did provide parents with was um, a list of questions that they can ask their teachers about academic success and how they're supporting the children in social emotional development as well. We also provided questions for parents to ask their children at home about school so that there is that school connection, that school and home connection. We provided parents in the fall for the parents who came in, we gave them the pre um, SAT practice test so that they would have access to that with their children leading up to the major PSAT time when we take that for high school admission. We also provided parents with resources to help their children with the Illinois Assessment of Readiness, which is the IR test that we take this year. We will take it in March. Um, so that is the most summative test. And um, we showed parents the connection from MAP to the IAR and how that drives the way that we provide their student with educational services at Lindop School. But it seems to have been very successful thus far. And for the next part of our presentation, Mr. Kenobi is going to come forward and talk about our parties and absences and what he's been doing on that journey. That's been pretty interesting as well. Thank you. Good evening, Board of Education, teachers, staff, and guests. Happy New Year. So part of the 
the plan, the action steps, as uh, Dr. Jackson has communicated, is looking at charges and absences uh, at the eighth grade level. Now, one thing in terms of tardies is, is changing what uh, parents in the community see as tardies being as important as absences because those minutes of instruction add up over time. And what you find is students are missing substantial instruction if they're late to school, especially at that first period class. So what happened was, and I'll, I put a couple documents by, if you want to reference, there's a tardy document and there's a attendance success plan. I'm gonna reference the tardy expectation. Now, based on the code of conduct, as you can see, the diagram is our current eighth graders and some of the tardies, 45 plus. So you can see the interventions put in place across the board in green. And of course, that student is on Dr. Jackson's desk and radar right now. And what we did for that particular student is we created a agreement with the parent and actually the student signs in each and every day. The parent agreed to drop them off, them off at 810 and they sign in in the front office to make sure they get to class on time. And since we implemented that before break, the student has been to class on time every day. So I'm gonna move to the next di diagram. As you're moving down, we can celebrate the 12 of our eighth graders have had no tardies whatsoever. So some of the things before break that we looked at is other school districts. And one thing we have here, we have a policy 770 and it has to do with truancy and absence. Another district, District 89 has policy 772, which is a tardy policy. So what we did was we looked at the code of conduct. Tardies are considered group three. From one to six in our code of conduct, you have one and two or more minor classroom disruptions. Three, you get more, four, five, by the time you hit six, it's very evasive, weapons, drugs, et cetera. So tardies are, are ranked up there in the group three category, but parent meetings, notices, you know, three or more tardies for a month was really not impacting because you had repeat uh, offenders, students that still had a pattern, even after you met in person with the parents. So what we did was we reestablished an expectation for tardies, rolled it out on December 22nd, and that's what you see in front of you is ever since we've come back from break, when we came back on that Tuesday, we implemented and we're tracking on a daily basis every student that comes in tardy and what tardy infraction they're on and communicating that to the parent. And so far, nobody's had three, but we notify the parent ahead of time, letting them know each tardy counts, every tardy counts. We want these students to school on time. So that's what the communication that went home and it went home via blast, email, class dojo, went out several times. And the students actually took a physical copy home. Now, hand in hand with tardies, we have absences. So these are our current eighth graders with 10 plus absences, six to eight. As you can see, different interventions with absences. Of course, penalties or consequences look different for absences, right? Not necessarily gonna give a child a detention for being out of school sick or unexcused. You have to pursue it a little bit differently. So if students have nine, nine absences, unexcused is, is a status of truancy. At that point, West 40 is involved in that department. Stephanie Pickett, the West 40 Attendance Network, which myself and Mrs. Apari Sephora are part of, this is a West 40 approved uh, attendance success plan that we're gonna implement and use with the parents when we start getting into those absences of nine plus. So I do have that there, but it allows the parents to really just dive into supports around them and what, how can the school support you? This is how we can support, but how can you have family around you support at home to get the students to school on time, but also those substantial absences, how can we work with the family to provide support? And the number one thing they said at West 40 is invite the parents in and have that conversation. 
Anyone have any questions? Williams Wolford. With the tardies that you listed here, um, I noticed that it's 37. Are you able to um, to break the data down by grade level? Yes. So all the tardies listed and absences here are current eighth graders. Oh, so everything. This is eighth grade. Okay. So eighth grade is our focus. Now, mind you, this is implemented seventh, sixth grade down with the tardy expectations and absences. But since our main focus of discussion has been eighth grade, I wanted to use this data to demonstrate what our action steps have been put in place to do things differently that decrease the numbers, but make it more meaningful for the families in terms of support from the school. Okay, I guess what I'm confused at is how many eighth graders are there? Because on one page is 32, on this one is 37. I thought we had said it was 36. So I'm not clear how many eighth graders we have total. So there's, there's 37 eighth graders, okay, in terms of the tardies. Now with absences, we have a certain, we have, without disclosing information, we have, we have certain students that are homebound, things like that are, po that are part of our, our population, but may be alternative placed but are on our rosters, if that makes sense. But we still accounted for when they were at school, their tardies and absences. I'm sorry, when you're saying that, are you saying that they're placed outside of Lindop or are they placed in, are they, is Lindop their school they're attending? Lindop is, is the home school, but we have a population of 37 eighth graders. But let's say if you have a student that's registered as a Lindop student that may be homebound, and doing and doing that, they're still part of our roster in terms of 37 students. We don't eliminate them and call it 36. If they attended school or they were absent, we include that as part of our Lindop is is our home school. Um, is there any way then possible? Because it's hard to follow the data when on the first. When we're talking about parent meetings, there's 32 total students there. But then when you look at um, the tardies, it says a total of 37 there. And then on another page, it says 36. So can we just be consistent with whatever number of population that we're referring to for the eighth graders? So then that way. Yes. And just to answer your question, thank you for that. That's the example of. For absences, that one particular student that's homebound is not counted as absenteeism for that report for 36. For tardies, originally we had, I understand, but trying to exp they're attending school, but homebound, but not considered part of the absences. I guess I can put in the report for next time, 37 population for absenteeism, but then disclose that Uh, any further questions? I'd like to thank all of you for your presentation. Yeah, on the Ms. first Williams page Wolford. with the eighth grade parent meetings, then there's, uh, what, four students missing then? What is going on with And those are students that have IEPs, and so Mrs. Keeper will be a part of those meetings. And so these are just the gen ed that we are um, utilizing now. Those are the ones that we met with. So going forward, just so we'll have the data consistent, is there a way you can note on the bottom or something to say for students, but like with that one student is excluded because they're homebound, so they're not included in that. On this page, um, mm -hmm. I don't know what the homebounder would be considered in terms of the parent meetings. Are we still having meetings with them, expecting that child to excel as well? With those students, that's why we're waiting for Mrs. Keeper. She's going to chair those meetings to talk about it because they're, we have to make sure that the child, even though they're homebound, is receiving the services that they need. And so for absences and tardies, no, that child would not be included. So No, I'm, I apologize. Maybe I wasn't clear. Um, with the parent meetings, the one that's homebound, that would be 
part of the IEP population. So then it will be five IEP students. Yes, okay. ma'am. So if we can get, you know, just notes or something to reference so that we, we can stay consistent with the numbers. Yes. I got a question. Mm -hmm. What do the number of students have to do with the action plan that they put in place? Is that to me? I thought I thought we was just trying to figure out the action plan, not I mean the number of students. Do that really matter? It matters in the sense like if you're looking at data, if you're looking at the entire eighth grade population and there's 37 students, you want your data to always reference 37 students. Because otherwise it's like if one data sheet is saying 32, what's going on with the other five? It's great to know these other five have IEPs. So, you know, their situation is different in terms of attendance. It's 36 because one is homebound. So homebound student isn't included. So your data always total up how many students you're looking at. Does that make sense? Okay. It's like if you're counting your money. You always want to come up to the same amount, whether you're talking about what you did with it or whatever, you still want to come up to the same total. Okay, can we move on? Thank you. Again, thank all of you for your presentation. It was very insightful. Yep. Next, we have a... Uh, update on construction. Good evening, Board of Education, administrators, staff members, and community members. Um, I just want to give a quick update on our masonry repair for our summer project. This is an outline of two different options that Archon proposed. I went with option one due to the fact that I would like to get this in progress faster than waiting an additional month to bring it to the board in February or in March. Uh, what this is. It locks in who our vendor would be to do this work, get them locked in, try to get better pricing. So I went with the accelerated schedule on this. Um, just to kind of go through where we're currently at with this, Archon did submit the bid notice. The bid notice has been posted in the Sun-Times. It's also posted out on BHFX for vendors to log in now and view the plans for the masonry work which will be done over the summer. There will be a pre-bid, which is mandatory for all vendors to come out. If they don't come out, they're not gonna be part of the bid opening. So it is a mandatory pre-bid meeting for vendors, which is gonna be on uh, 131. So this gives vendors a couple weeks to look at the specs of all the masonry with it, and then come to that pre-mandatory bid meeting and then submit in their bid. Um, we will have a bid opening in February, which will be February 9th. That gives Archon and the district time to go through all the bids and do reference checks to ensure that the company checks out with the scope of the project for completing the entire masonry work which is the entire west wall from one side to the other with it. Um, a recommendation will be coming then from Archon to the board at the February meeting for approval to lock this in. And then the tentative start date is somewhere that last week of school. We're hoping to have everything here on site on the west parking lot with the scaffolding and everything that would be needed out there to start the project, which would be in full force June 5th, following the conclusion of our school. There is a couple things that we got to keep in mind just to keep out there. Potentially, this can impact our summer school that we offer to our students. So as they're doing their masonry work, there will be some grinding noise. We believe that if we shut the corridors in between all the exterior hallway that they're working on and the interior one, 
the noise should be minimal during our four and a half hour summer school session, which would then have to be located in our middle school wing. So that's just something that we need to um, keep aware of that potentially this can impact our summer school with it. But like I said, I wanted to bring forth the timeline for our summer project for the masonry work. Is there any questions at this time? Uh, yes, Cheryl Griffin, I have one. There are gonna be precautions put in place to make sure that no adults are ch or children can go into those areas. My, my guess is that there will be probably a temp fence put up to block the entire parking lot with it that can probably be moved as construction is being done in the back. And they're gonna be doing it in sections with it. So there will be precautions with that. Obviously that's gonna be something that we will iron out with Archon right. as we get closer to the start date on that to ensure the safety of not only the faculty right. or community and our students so that no one can get back there okay. and potentially be injured. Right. Are there any further questions? Ms. Williams Wolford? Have we did anything to attract um, bids from minority companies, quality minority companies? The best that I can tell you on this one is I'm following bidding procedures as set forth by school code with it. Um, I do not know any minority companies offhand that would do the masonry work. If anybody has it, I can reach out to them and say that it is out there on BHFX and point them in the right direction with it. Uh, with it, I do know that there is a major company in Broadview that specializes in tuck pointing. And I'm anticipating that they potentially could be a viable vendor for a project if they come in at the lowest responsible bid. So it might not be a minority company. However, it could be a company located within Broadview. Um, if anybody has minority construction company contact information, I am able, if you could please forward that through Dr. Jackson, and then I'll work through Dr. Jackson and get them the information um, that would be public out there with our bid spec. We'll get it to them. Any further questions? Okay, thank you so much for thank the you. information provided. Can I get a recommendation for old business item four? Tanya Taylor, I make a motion that the board approves a 36 month contract with Comcast at a monthly cost of 1,665 per month which is $19,980 per year. Board member Hannah, I second. Thank you. Um, discussion? No. Good evening, Board of Education, community members, staff. Uh, so we had, for year eight, we had two people, companies bid on it, AT&T, they were significantly higher than Comcast. It was $2,800 almost, and then $448 for IP addresses, which is brand new. All the companies are charges for IP addresses now, and then Comcast was significantly cheaper at $1,590, and then $75 for IP addresses. And it, it, our previous was $1,995 per month. So it is a little lower, but we are having to pay for IP addresses, which I don't know if it's erratable or not, but that's the cost. I, I couldn't get them to combine it. Any questions? Anyone? I just want to add to this. This is what we spoke about in the yes. technology. So this is just a recap of what we spoke uh -huh. about uh, in the last meeting that we had for technology. And we spoke about it at the last board so, meeting so as well. Yeah. Okay. In the last board meeting. okay. Thank you so much for the information. Can I get a vote? A roll call? Board member Alexander? Yay. Board President Griffin? Yay. Board Member Williams Wolford? Yay. Board Secretary Taylor? Yay. Board Vice President Hannah? Yay. Board Member Dawson? Absent. Board Member Morris? Yay. Motion passes. Cheryl Griffin? 
I make a motion that the board approve to upgrade network equipment at a total cost of $184,116.03 as follows. E-rate payment of 59,000, state payment 22,000, district payment of $80,024.30. Tanya Taylor, I second the motion. Any discussion? Discussion on this? Okay. Can we have a roll call? Board President Griffin? Yay. Board Member Alexander? Yay. Board Vice President Hannah? Yay. Board Secretary Taylor? Yay. Board Member Morris? Yay. Board Member Williams Wolford? Yay. Board Member Dawson, absent. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. For new business, we have a discussion on PTEL. Mr. Barani. Good evening, Board of Education, administrators, staff, and community members. Um, pursuant Public Act 1020519, Cook County annually um, releases a recapture levy amount, which is different than the levy that we submitted in December. Uh, what this levy is, it is an additional levy to make governmental agencies whole due to PTAB um, tax objections. Um, that happen within your community with it. In board book, I attached the spreadsheet that showed um, all of the taxing bodies in Cook County and what the amounts were. The biggest thing with this one, the board has to either accept the money or abate the money. And if the board decides to abate the money, it would have to be done by April 1st. So what I wanted to do um, as a business manager with Improviso Township, I wanted to look at what are the other districts and what is our dollar amount that LINDOP 92 would be owed to make the district whole due to the PTAB objections or the tax objections that happened over the 12 months prior. So LINDOP's amount on this is roughly $355,000 of additional revenue that would make the district whole on it. And you can look at the different districts which are out there. We always try to compare what other districts are doing within the Proviso Township. So I also did a quick pull of all of the business managers in Proviso Township and what they were going to do with their recapture levy. So the trend is that the majority of the districts are going to accept the recapture levy in whole and make their levies whole and their revenue whole from their tax collection. Uh, not one district uh, put in there that they were going to abate and give the money back. Uh, the biggest thing here uh, with this recapture levy, things are not going down in price. Um, inflation is still pretty high with it. Uh, prices are going up on everything, and this is just a way to make the district whole by accepting the recapture. It is my recommendation to accept the money. However, the board can decide to abate, and you would have till April 1st on this, but this would make the district whole with the request that we had through our 2022 tax levy. And remember, our levy is what we use to operate our district in the upcoming calendar year, which is 2023. Are there any questions in regards to this new act that has put out? This is the second year of the act. Last year, the district chose to do nothing and accept the money with it. And we received our recapture funds with it. Each year annually, the board has the option either to accept or abate. And if we decide to abate as a district, it would have to be done by April 1st to Cook County. Mm -hmm. So we still have the February meeting and the March meeting. I will be bringing this back to the board each meeting. And ultimately, like you said, we 
the board will have to come to a decision on, on this. But if there is any questions at this time, we will take them. Anyone? Okay, but I have one question. You will let us know at what point we should put this on for approval, correct? To give yourself plenty of time. We technically don't have to approve it. Oh, really? On it, if the board just chooses to leave the recapture levy out there, you don't have to do it. It's automatically there oh, as part of it. You would just have to do an approval if you were going to abate. Oh, okay. And there Thank is specific you. paperwork that would have to go in for the abatement um, that would be submitted to Cook County. Thank you. Okay. Next, we'll have a discussion on community engagement. Uh, first and foremost, I have to apologize to Ms. Alexander because this was an item that was put on at the last minute. Because um, what we were thinking of in brainstorming with regards to community engagements to work on Lendop's brand, we would like to try to go out to community events. Like say, sometimes when they're having things, they have regular events at the park district with the seniors. And I had spoke with several seniors at the last breakfast that they had where they were discussing their willingness to help with at the school, be it tutoring, reading, or what. So that would be another thing that we could tap into, and that would be one of our sources of community engagement. Also, any other events where, say, if there was an opportunity to put up a Lendop booth or just to go there and mingle with everyone to get the message out about Lendop, that was another option that we were looking at. And that would conclude my uh, discussion on community engagement. Any further comments or questions? Yeah. Okay. All right, all right. I have another question. Go ahead. So in regards to the community engagement slot, how do uh, outside uh, community, um, is there a form or something that they will fill out to let us know that they're interested um, in partnership with us or do we start next steps? Uh, we're actually going to, I'm going to put together a list where people can put on it and what their interest is. And then once we see what the interest is, then we'll be put together something, number one, to make sure that they don't have records, you know, anything that we would normally have in place to protect the children. Thank you. You're welcome. Any further comments or questions? Okay. Can I get someone to give a motion on item three of new business? All right, Vice President Hannah, I make a motion that the board approve the purchase of the kid millionaire curriculum in the amount of $46,775. Cheryl Griffin, I second. Can we have a discussion? Good evening once again. Um, so as we've been trying to make sure that we're not only talking about the academics, but the importance of foundational and generational wealth. And we had tried to reach out to Ariel Investments for a while to uh, come in and to help our students. Uh, no one really responded to us. I was looking through my emails. I had something from Kid Millionaire. I reached out to uh, the sender of the email, who is the owner of the company, and had a discussion and uh, she came in, showed us her curriculum, but also talked about the importance of having families involved as well. And so we'll just talk a little bit about some of the things uh, that she's done uh, with the children. She has support for teachers. So this 46,000 is just like we are purchasing a new curriculum. However, our curriculum is normally 183,000, whatever it is. There are no consumables with this curriculum. Uh, we opted out for the app portion of it, and she is also working side by side with our eighth grade teacher, uh, Mrs. Stewart, who is our math teacher, and she also teaches our high school math credit class. 
And she is modeling for her so that she can further infuse that with the children uh, and also make sure that they are having exactly what they need. Dr. Betts um, has also worked with uh, the owner of the company. We're going to show you a couple of videos after Dr. Betts talks a little bit about how this fits into our electives program uh, and specifically for finance. Thank you, Dr. Jackson, and good evening again. Um, so Kid Millionaire is providing a curriculum for us as well as being side by side with all of our eighth grade teachers, and we are um, having all of our eighth grade students come into the room for this class. So she is here with our team in person on Mondays and Tuesdays. She's, in addition to that, providing support to our teachers for how they can make connections to social emotional development. So think about investments and how you choose which company to invest with. Do you look for uh, the company's mission, whether they're contributing in a positive way to the global interconnectedness that we are as a global community? Um, how do you determine whether or not your investment is going to be successful over the long term? And so there's nothing about get rich quick, but she she tries to instill in the children how they can use their finances to drive their own dreams. So she's asking them things like, if you want to be a doctor, do you want to be a rich doctor or a poor doctor? So she's making them think differently. And it goes much deeper than that. She has an entire book of materials that they're able to access as well. Um, she's not only teaching them about investments, but about banking. Um, and then she's tying this into also our forensic science and our debate and public speaking electives on top of everything else with financial literacy. So it's a very robust curriculum. Um, the videos will show you some of her uh, former students who have been successful with this program. And then we will be able to repeat this program in the future using the materials and what our teachers have learned working with her. Okay, so yes, we had her, um, sorry, since it was Christmas break, it was winter break and children were getting money. We got really excited. And, and so she kind of came in right after that winter break and she was really asking the students, what are you doing with the money that you received? You're just gonna go spend it somewhere? Or are you gonna put some of it away? Are you going to invest some of it? And in addition to everything else, she's also offering an opportunity for parents and children to partner on opening a bank account where the bank will give them a certain amount of money to establish their account in the beginning. So she's really trying to make this relevant for the students and thinking about, you know, if you want that pair of shoes, is it something that you need right now? Maybe it is, right? But if, if it's not something that you're thinking about for 30 days, you know, do you really need it? Is it just a fad that that might be gone? in the future. So thinking about where you're putting your money and what that's doing for you, is it working for you even when you might not be actively working for it? Hi, my name is Jaquil Jackson. I'm 12 years old and I have an organization called Project I Am. So today I want to talk about the K Millionaire program. This program helped me a lot with learning how to market, and branding and counting my money. This was very helpful because I have two businesses and this was a big help to learn what to do in certain situations. So I wanna thank Miss Wood so much because she gave me my first speaking engagement. And I was so nervous, but I thank her so much now because of the way I've grown from that. So I recommend this program to any kid who wants to learn about business and wants to get started. Bye. I'm here to affect change in our world. How am I doing that? 11-year-old Jaquiel Jackson likes to tell his peers in Chicago to dream big and also think about those less fortunate. The first time I saw a homeless person was when I was about five years old and it just really made me sad to see him on the streets because my thought everybody had homes. He would see people on the street and he's like, mom, we got to do something, we got to help. I asked my mom if I could give them all houses, but we couldn't do that. When Jaquiel was eight years old, he realized there was something he could do. With help from family and friends, he created Project I Am, collecting donations of shampoo, soap, socks, and more, then assembling them into what he called 
blessing bags. I totally thought that this was going to be a phase and he just kept at it. He wouldn't let it go. Over the last three years, Shaquille has given away more than 20,000 bags to people in need. He's also caught the attention of some special supporters. He's been recognized by President Obama as one of 2017's most influential people. It was him and two other people, so he was the only kid. And people were kind of like, Barack Obama is tweeting about your son. And I'm like, what? <laughs> when I met him, it was a great experience. My mom was at, had a heart attack. LeBron James, King James, invited me to be a part of his campaign, Always Believed, and he shared my story on his Instagram. You do not have to wait until you are an adult to be great. But despite his newfound fame, Shaquille stays focused on what's most important to him. Today we are at a facility that helps homeless people get back on their feet, and I'm going to bless them with blessing bags. When I'm giving the bags to people, it makes me feel like I'm getting one step closer to demolishing the whole homeless thing. Then it really makes me happy to see the smiles on their faces when I give the bags to them. Thank you. There's way more homeless people in the world that I could help and that I need to help. Any questions? Uh, Ms. Taylor. <laughs> First of all, thanks for uh, sharing. Um, I have a better understanding because earlier looking through board books, I didn't get the gist of really what was going on. Um, my question to you is, I'm, I'm certain that our audience right now is our eighth grade students, correct? Yes. What yeah. type of uh, curriculum around financial needs or investments is the current teacher, Ms. Stewart, presenting to our students currently? She doesn't have a curriculum. Okay. She does not. She is just following based upon what she knows and some um, the standards that Dr. Betts has helped her align her lessons to, but there is not a particular curriculum. We do not have one. Okay. For an example, I know a um, few years back, maybe more than a few, um, Fifth Third Bank that was here in Broadview did a lot of partnerships with Linda. They're no longer in the space. My suggestion to this would be, since this is new, why don't we start with our local, a local bank? Cause you were saying it shows investments, it shows our students how to open up a bank account. It'll tap into social emotional. I'm just trying to understand why are we starting with such a high mark with this vendor? So we, we have had a financial literacy course in place for eighth grade. This is our second year, um, but we really haven't been able to stabilize it with robust information on investments and um, everything else that has to do with the financial world. So this will help us to anchor in that. And I'm sure that we can work with Kid Millionaire on finding a local bank Um but yeah, so I, I mean, I'm sure that's not a problem. She has with her company, a partnership with a, a bank that may have a branch in the area. And I cannot remember, I'm sorry, off the top of my head, what the bank is. Um, but that's the bank that she partners with. So I'm sure that she can establish that with someone else just as easily. But I think the value of this is that we're getting materials. Um, we're getting something that the teacher can go through that she's going to sit side by side and watch how this program should be implemented uh, so that she doesn't feel like she's kind of flying blind in a way. And she's done a very good job so far, but she has not had anything consistent. Okay. So I just want to make sure that I understand. So what you're telling me that this program would just be a foundation for Linda to start a financial literacy program that would direct and help our students and not only our students, our parents, but also a curriculum. So it's suggested that our teachers learn this foundation to roll it out year after year after year. So as far as you're saying that this package, the one-time payment, I'm guessing, of the 46,000, well, almost $47,000 is something that 
would just be our foundation going forward. So it's like buying a licensing uh, from this individual. Yes, it gives us exclusive licensing rights to her to use her materials and to use her program and to implement it the way that she would implement it. She, of course, can't be with us, you know, all the time in the future, but she's we have her right now. And so we're also buying her services and consulting with us to help the teachers learn how to implement the program, because one of the the really interesting things about it is that the teachers are saying, well, I don't I didn't even know that. How can I how can I know this? Like, can you give us some teacher PD on financial literacy? And she has agreed that she would come in and do that for us. But in addition to that, if if teachers are not feeling equipped for their own financial literacy, it's difficult for them to pass that on to students. And I will say that, you know, our teacher who has been doing this is she's been making it work. She's been doing a great job. She learns the material. She puts it out there. But there's nothing like someone who really understands it in depth. And so she needs that side-by-side -side support in order to be able to do this in the future as well. Okay, I promise this is my last question, I promise. <laughs> okay. As far as uh, the state of Illinois is concerned, and as far as looking at a projective curriculum for our students in a financial uh, area investment situation, as far as learning, is this a state requirement for this piece of... Um, curriculum to be added or why are we coming forth at this point to tap in into financial obligations or financial learning or strategies for our youth at this point? It is not currently a mandate from the state of Illinois. However, there are other things out there. So like the Illinois State Treasurer's Office has a very small unit for each grade level on financial literacy. It is something that the state pushes. It's something that you can you know, take in high school if they offer that elective. But the reason that we wanna do it is because our children deserve it. And they deserve that opportunity to engage in that level of discussion and that way of thinking. Because whenever we open our minds to something that's new and we get access to new vocabulary and new concepts that we might not have ever thought of before, because I know for me, some of the stuff that she's bringing, I'm like, okay, what's that? I don't even know. Um, but that gives our students access to new social groups and layers of the economy. It gives them um, an opening into some of the institutional um, monetary devices that we have in our country and globally. And that's just something that uh, it it's really hard to find an actual curriculum on right now. So we did look in other places with, with the eighth grade team in the fall. Um, I did manage to get a couple of units through a company Nearpod that we already have access to. Um, so they tacked on a 21st century learning component to their materials, but it still is not the depth. It's It doesn't span the robust nature of everything that Kid Millionaire goes over. And I think too that one of the things that's making it so interesting for the children is that they're connecting to her because she's asking them different questions and she's thinking about finances in a completely different way than I've ever even thought of them. So I'm right there with the teachers to say, I never thought about, you know, where are my investments going? Is it a company that I agree with their practices? Are they contributing to the things that we believe they should be contributing to? Um, and then just thinking about my my values and my goals as a student, and right now they're so young, this is such an opportunity for them to build out some solid financial practices going forward. Okay, I lied. Is there a mock opportunity uh, before th this contract can be signed where this person is on location, you say only Monday and Tuesday, twice a week, uh, with our staff here, so is there like a mock trial, maybe like a 10 day trial or two visit trial where they come out and just give you guys the basics of how this is gonna roll out? Yeah. That's exactly what she's been doing. And so now, um, now that she's been doing that, it's been going really well. We'd like to formalize that relationship and, and opt into her services if you guys agree with that. So just give, just can you just give the board an example? Like what was something that was so amazing that was strategized or taught just a simple thing like opening up a bank account. I'm very curious because this is a lot of money. It's not just opening up a bank account. I well, think, I'm just saying like yeah. 
what that was just a basis right. of some. I mean, I, I value the principles of teaching kids or children early about finance, about money. So just like some simple, what would be her take on or the that company take on with small things? Just give me an example of like what you guys discovered in the trial session. The So one of the things that if you were in the classroom, you would see the engagement from students has increased. The um, questions that students are asking that they were not asking before um, because they didn't even, I don't think have the vocabulary or the input to think about even asking some of these questions. Um, I think the relevancy to you know the idea that I don't have to wait until I'm an adult to establish some type of um, financial track record that's positive I don't have to wait to start a business. If I have an idea now, what can I do? And what's really amazing about that too is that when we do some of our STEM courses and we do things like mobile app development or um, when we're talking about designing um, things like robots or 3D printing items, these are things that are problem-based and driven by issues that I need to solve that I see around me. And so this kind of taps into that as well. So it just, for me, like what she's bringing goes really hand in hand with a lot of our electives courses. And these are things that we don't necessarily have time for in the core. So students are able to think about things in a different way. So you're able to still write and speak and do math, but it's, it's more relevant. It's based more on like, if I got a hundred dollars for Christmas, what percentage of that can I save? What can I do with this? What, how will this money work for me? If I put it away now, what will it be in two years, in five years when I graduate high school? And so she's looking at that, not just as like a, an interest bearing checking account at a bank, but going into investments. How would I do that if I were going to do that? And she's working through the markets with the students. And so she's giving them a completely different view than what we were able to do without her input and her materials. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Cheryl Griffin, I have a question. Actually, it's a two-part question. Uh, number one would be, I would think that one of the major building blocks of any process of trying to build or work with their finances would be budgeting. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard anything about, have the students been told anything about budgeting? That is a section of this. It just, it wasn't... Um one of the things that came up in the trial run, but yes, she does have information about budgeting in her, in her materials, yes. Okay, my second item would be, is there gonna be something set up that would, shall we say, continually assess whether or not the program was being enforced the way it was originally taught? Mm -hmm. So yes, it is. And so uh, where we first found a little bit of hesitation with the sixth through eighth grade teachers or the eighth grade teachers, the there are three, it is not now because now they're looking at this and saying, I never knew how this could work. As we began to talk about attacking that 70%, this also falls directly into that also with our college and career readiness, our goals for that, that we have to make sure that we uh, complete and what better way is it than to begin with a mindset. Now we're also gonna have something for teachers that is a someone else that we're looking at from outside. It's not a curriculum, but just to be able to reinforce that education so that people are aware of how to utilize their money and to make wise decisions. Um, I wish we could have videoed some of the children in class because the questions that they were asking and the excitement that they had and as you may or may not know, exciting eighth graders are not always that easy, and especially when they have to sit into a classroom, but everyone was just sitting there very intently listening and asking questions, and I think it probably took them over the top when she gave them money for Christmas and then asked them to do specific things with that. So that's the things that um, are helping us most greatly and also helping to narrow that number down or to decrease that 70%. And that's part of the why. 
Okay, thank you. My only reason for asking that second part of that is because there have been several programs that we have purchased before, only to find out at a later date that they weren't still being implemented in the way in which they were intended. Right, and if you talk about the, uh, or think about the apps, right, where the entire school was sort of in an uproar because they had been taken away, uh, what we found is that some teachers were even using maybe 33,000. I know we did a presentation on this. Maybe it was December or November. So about 33,000 minutes on an app, uh, but there was no return on investment. And they were pretty much just working with the computer without that human interaction. And so it takes it away from that. We did not opt into any apps or any online things now, but the focus is to build a strong foundation. And how you do it is to change the thinking. Thank you. Any further questions? Thank you. Go ahead, Ms. Alexander. Uh, good evening. Um, just in um, in a little more detail, I'm just curious. With the overall program for Kid Millionaire, are there any, I would say, performance metrics that you've identified to translate over, Dr. Bex, to the uh, students who participate in this from their daily curriculum? So students have a project within the curriculum. They have to create their own business. They have to present that business. They have to, that will be where the budgeting comes in. Um, and so it has to make money. You don't want to go into business and lose money. Of course, we're not talking about, you know, massive amounts of real dollars with this, but she is giving them some seed money so that they can actually try to implement an actual business. It's not like, you know, going to become a Fortune 500 overnight, but it will be a Fortune 500 someday, right, in the future. So students will be doing a project with that, and they do have to meet financial performance expectations for that project. Okay, and my final question is just simply, uh, forgive me if I missed it, what is the contract duration for this amount? How long is that? She will be with us through the end of the school year. She's here two days a week in person. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, she meets with the teachers to help them make standards-based connections to their own um, elective, so forensic science and debate and public speaking. So if you think about forensic accounting, going back into um, a business's books and finding out where did something go wrong, um, so that's, those are connections that she's able to make because you don't really think about crime scene investigation or forensic science as being in that area, but it can be. Um, I'm so sorry, I forgot the question. I got excited about Kid Millionaire. <laughs> no, I just was curious about the, the, the duration of the okay, contract yes. tenure. Since Thank I you. Yes, yeah, so she'll be, she'll be here with us through the end of the school year. She also will... Um, is willing to come in and do professional development for teachers because you know there are things like student loan forgiveness that is not easy it is not easy to go through that process I can tell you from firsthand experience right it is not easy and so she's willing to help teachers with those practical things in addition to you know where am I investing my money we have the teacher retirement system but what else am I doing do I have annuities am I doing some type of IRA investment and so she is willing to come in and do some professional development on that with teachers as well within this contract will those topics for the um for the educators be more so ad hoc or will you all work together to kind of identify like what the specific course will be yeah, we'll work together with the teachers to find out what their needs are. And then um, we would implement those on our SIP days, which we do have several coming up in the next few months. Thank you. I know for the question. Uh, one final question. Will we be kept up abreast, say, on a quarterly, uh, what is it, timeline as to what the success is or how it's progressing? As much as you would like to have, absolutely we will. And we can even have children to come in and speak as well. That would so they great. can give you their opinions and how it's going during the uh, courses. Okay, thank you. Does anyone else, Ms. Williams-Wolf? You mentioned that she's given the students seed money um, for business. This is real money? And if so, how much? Per student. Okay. I I believe that it is it's very small. It's like a $25 amount. And 
it's so like when we're talking about building a business, you know, you can't just, you know, you, you can't blow your budget, right? You have to work within in the constraints of what you have, but being creative and figuring out how to market and turn that $25 into something more. I believe that's what it is. I would, I have all of her paperwork on my desk. I apologize. One more question. The, I'm sorry, the um, $47,000, where is these funds coming from? Do we have any grant? Any Out of Title, title one. one. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? Can we get a roll call? Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Thank you, um, board, board Secretary Taylor, for asking that question. Where does the funds come from? Because um, most of the agenda items do say that on here. However, that one didn't. So that would have been helpful to know where the funds are coming from in the motion. Thanks. Anything further? Thank you. So noted, uh, Mrs. Wolfer. Thank you for bringing that up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, can we get a roll call? For President Griffin? Yay. For Vice President Hamlin? Yay. For Secretary Taylor? Yay. Board Member Alexander? Yay. Board Member Dawson? Yay. Board Member Morris? Yay. Board Member Williams Wolford? Motion passes. Okay, can I get a motion on item four? Tanya Taylor, making a, a uh, uh, I make a motion that the board approve the contract of Victor Woods, Success International Incorporated for the amount of $21,600 to be paid from the community partnership grant. Cheryl Griffin, I second. Is there a discussion? Dr. Jackson? Yes. Yeah. these questions and making sure that we're dotting all of our I's and crossing all of our T's and especially as we continue to move towards moving that 70% down. And so Victor Woods um, is a consultant with, Inter, uh, with Success International. This contract is very much the same as we have that we bring every year. Uh, we just had his later, but it would be the same as we do for InterVision when they come in. We have the um, the actual outline of what they'll be doing. They're working with mail in the school system. Um, he has a very um, interesting uh, background and why he likes to give back to children. Um, we have a video that talks a little bit about his story and why he went into that. But also um, after the video is over, I will give you some more information. Can tell me a little bit more about this movie, though, and about your life. Did you, did you, did you, did you, did you see the movie Catch Me If You Can? Yeah. All right, so at one time I made $40 million worth of Visa Gold cards. And so that's just one thing I did. I grew up in Orleans and Heights out in the suburbs. So Kevin uh, is making a movie about my life. They're actually writing the screenplay now. Alfonso Morgan Terrero is writing the screenplay. Brian Smiley is the president of Part of Productions, and uh, it's going to be a major motion picture. Sure, I don't think anybody can catch you. I don't know what that movie is going to be called, but you're That's in trouble. You know, I, I'm thinking about the, the, book, sort of the book is called The Breed of Heart, published by Simon & Schuster. So the movie is based on my life story. Okay, so that just talks a little bit of how he was. Now, he grew up in a very affluent neighborhood, both college-educated parents. Father graduated from Morehouse, mom graduated from Spelman. So he had everything 
that you would think someone would need, especially a, a child, but not so much. Uh, there were some issues that he dealt with when he began school uh, out in Arlington Heights. He was uh, called uh, racist names all of the time, going back and forth to school. Uh, he was not much of a talker back then as he is now, but he was not much of a talker then. And so his way to sort of come in and be recognized was to do these mischievous things. He had a school newspaper. No one knew how it was published, uh, but his mind began working. He spent some prison time um, away, maybe about six years or so. I met him back in 2003 and utilized him in Bellwood School District 88 for the male mentoring program there. But what he wanted to do was make sure that he came back and talked to young men before they got to a point where they had to do something where it did not require a background check right then because of maybe some of the marks that you have on your record from doing things. Um, he tours around the country. Um, I think he is very uh, similar to, I know Mr. Morris, when he came out of Triple I, we were talking about a chef that gave a presentation and how he had that background. And so uh, Victor has that background, but he's doing something about it. He also spends a lot of time in the juvenile detention centers, as well as the uh, Cook County Department of uh, Corrections. But his uh, goal and his motivation is to help minority students get to a different level, know that they don't have to take the road of um, making $40 million as a, in credit cards, but how they need to do it and what is missing, but getting back down to the why. Are there any questions? Yes. Ms. Taylor. Sorry. Okay. I get it. I get that we have used Mr. Woods in the past. I get that part. We have not. Oh, we have not. No, okay. I, thought, I was I saying that said. the contracts that come through when we come every like September or something will come through with um, InterVision International with Mr. Bryant. We come through with uh, Mrs. Uh, Dr. Walker for literacy, these are the same types of uh, things, except his is geared on male mentoring. Okay, that's the part I missed, my apologies. However, we already have partnerships with three other sponsors of vendors as far as mentorship for our children. I'm not sure, or maybe I guess the right question would be is, um, the dialogue should have been, what have those other vendors or supporters as far as this um, experience or being, um, I don't know what word to use right now, the project of them helping our uh, male population? Okay, so the only ones that we've had to talk about with the male specifically, it has not been done. And so um, I'm not sure if Mr. Kenobi mentioned this in his report, but he's also doing a men of distinction to get the men more involved and collaborating with Black Men United for that. However, this is specifically uh, for male mentoring. And there's probably about 20 or so students, and it's from sixth through eighth grade, seventh and eighth grade. Mm -hmm. That's Okay, so you're saying, you're giving me the population of how many male students are currently working with whom? So that we're going, those are the ones who are going to be identified. Okay, mm -hmm. so Mr. Bryant, uh, the other uh, vendors or suppliers, I don't know what the, would be the right mm -hmm. persons to call them at this time, those sponsors, they have no uh, flexibility or uh, inability or ability to help our students because we currently have contracts with them. So just because, yeah, right, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And what we say is that it would not go over that amount. However, no one has ever exhausted uh, the amount of funds that they have. And so very frequently, Mr. Baranek, how many times would you say that we have one of those 20,000 and they're not met, they still have some carryover? Most 
Okay, so in that bucket, if we don't use that money, do it vanish? That it can't carry over. So my question to you and the administrative team, have we utilized the current suppliers or the current people that we have in place now and see if this can be a part of their of their curriculum of what they're bringing to Linda? So the only ones that we have so far, uh, specifically for male mentoring, or not even specific, because your question is, could any of them offer that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so Dwayne Bryant, who is the president of InterVision International, he has moved primarily to Florida and he does his work out of Tennessee and Florida. So he would come for our social media night as he has before to be able to talk to parents about the, um, the ills of that. That is specifically, that is his niche. That's what he works on. Uh, Mr. Um, Woods works with males and teaching them how to not go astray from the beginning and giving them an outlet. We also have uh, Mr. Shorter and Mr. Banks who work at the Park District who are also helping in this initiative as well to meet the, uh, the needs of the males, but also helping them with their vision and how they are going to go about uh, being great or moving from the space that they're in. They were not happy the first, the, um, when we first began talking about it. In fact, a lot of them did not uh, want to attend. However, however, after they have been looking at material or understanding what will be offered as well as the parents, they're falling in and they're coming in there. And even if it's after school, and that was also one of the things that we set up with some of the parents that we had speak, been speaking with for the children who have behavior problems um, and also part of that 70%. And the parents are all on board um, as far as this is something that is going to help um, our children and also seeing something that they can grab onto. Uh, sometimes children's interests are peaked at different levels and by different things. And so absolutely, this is not an opportunity to teach someone how to uh, replicate credit cards. That's not what it's about. The lessons learned from that is you can be great. There are ways to go about it and don't ever, ever end up in a situation like he did because he didn't say anything. And so we have a different group of children and with many different uh, backgrounds or behaviors, but he, this is what he does full time. So it's not, I just do it sometimes. He goes and he talks to um, school districts. He talks to police departments. I think they're about to do something with Chief Mills um, as well uh, for Broadview and making sure that they have, um, I guess, a light at the end of the tunnel and they don't have to go that far. But as far as your question about other ones that we have, uh, Black Men United are gonna be working specifically with um, Mr. Kenobi and bringing out numbers and helping us as we try to do things like um, having all dads bring their children to school or things like that. But as far as this with the classrooms and being in there, it would be on Tuesdays and Thursdays, he is the only one now that we have with that. Okay. My, I'm sorry, I got another question. So in regards to our current curriculum and in regards to moving kids millionaires club um, mm -hmm. on Mondays and Tuesdays, and now you, you, the administrative team want to add another piece to this. When, when, what does the time, what does the day This look is like? after school. So this is all after school. So okay. the mentoring that I'm talking about now is after school. The Kid Millionaire comes in their elective course, which is at the end of the day. Okay. So Mr. Woods is coming um, to the school. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's going to be chartered like an after school program, blah, blah, blah. Would the kids get snacked? I mean, like what, they do what does snacks. the day look like? So at the end of the day, they're out at 3.30. Um, they go into the room, they have snacks, and then they get started on their session. Mr. Uh, Banks and Mr. Shorter uh, have has been carrying that uh, pretty much as far as, you know, just talking to parents. But uh, absolutely, they are in there. So they have snacks at the end. We have ordered them through our, um, what grant was that, Mr. Uh, Baranek, our snacks? the community partnership grant for the snacks as well and making sure that the children uh, do have something. 
It lasts for about 45 minutes, uh, but it's intense. They have to complete a workbook with their vision. Uh, but this is not about just making money. This is helping them to be better human beings and also uh, be more civilized. Not that they are not civilized, but teaching them how to be proactive um, in a global civilization. Okay. And with the partnership that we currently have with the representatives from the park district, yeah. are they on board with coming? Because it, it almost sounds like they had something in plan. Now we bring someone in to trump their plan. Oh, or no. are they it's all together. working together? It's together. Okay. Oh, absolutely. And then as far as reinforcements, as far as staff, and utilization of getting these students home after 45 minutes after the bell rung, all, all this has been worked The out. parents, yes. Okay. So yes, we have a current commitment of the students already in place where they kind of maybe signed a contract saying that they're attenders and they will be there. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I'm yes, sorry. I just no, 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 no. need it's a fine. detail. It's oh, fine. Mr. Hannah. Good. Thank you. No so, problem. Thank you. Just a, a little bit. I, I don't have a question. Um, I just got a, a, a brief statement about this Mr. Woods guy. Um, I happened to be in the building as a parent that day. Um, I wasn't here in any board capacity, anything like that. I was just here as a parent. Actually, I think my baby was having a meltdown or something. She was doing something, and I just happened to be here. And I, on my way out, I stopped in the office, and I asked where was the district team. Well, they're upstairs. Okay, so I mostly back out the office and back upstairs. This general was full of boys, full of boys. The only person, the only two ladies that it was in this room, it was Dr. Jackson, Madam President, the only two. And it was all boys and this guy, Mr. Woods. And y'all know I'd be in and out. And I, I had to go to work, so I wasn't here long. And I, I just, I sat over on the side on the bleachers and I just watched the interaction that he was having with these young men. And like, if they even drifted, like they wanted to put their head down, yeah, 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 I was talking. Like you, what I just say? And they can tell him exactly what he just said. Like he had them attentive they're they they wasn't in space they wasn't oh can i go to the bathroom nothing like they were engaged in what he had going on mm -hmm. and i didn't get to to really chop it up with him just how you doing they introduced me and i got out of here but i definitely see that that our older boys they were definitely engaged in what he had going on. thank you i appreciate that um cheryl griffin my input on that would be that the thing that I noticed mostly was a lot of the young men were a bit hesitant at first to respond to questions that he asked specifically. He had, like say one of the questions was, how many of you have relatives that are currently incarcerated? At first, there was very few that would raise their hands, but when he talked to them and told them it was nothing to be ashamed of, he himself had been incarcerated once before. And once he put that out there, it was like a lot of them relaxed and they weren't ashamed. And it was amazing how many said that raised their hands when he asked about family members. Then when he asked how many of them had a parent that was incarcerated, they raised their hands for that also because they knew they were all together and they all had something in common. And he was basically trying to make sure that they didn't go down that same path. Madam President. Um, I think I was still in the building for that part. And I felt like a, a barrier was knocked down or they knew he wasn't in the, these kids. He not 12. You know what I mean? And these kids, everybody 12. You look sideways, oh, he 12. You know what I mean? But I feel like a barrier or they're, they're eligible, like for them to trust him when he said, they, hey, dude, listen, I'm just asking the question. Like I was the one that was locked up. I was the one behind the bars now hands started to come up and like they felt like they can right. now talk to him because he's not the police you know what i mean who is this dude in this suit we don't know him where he come from and i get i, I think they kind of felt like now right. we can talk to him because he know what's going on you know what i mean he know that yeah okay my dad and he asked him like how many of y'all dads are in jail exactly and these boys just they raised their, their hands. hands on up so he, he definitely got him engaged. That's how I was. Madam President, I yield my time. Ms. Williams Wolfer. So how many total students are we talking about impacted with this program? 27. And then my second question is, I know and definitely our, our young um, males need the support, but we've talked a lot about our males and maybe we've talked about the girls and I just forgot or whatever. Do we have something in place for our girls? 
as well. Thank you for asking. So I just received a uh, return phone call from Mrs. Fair of Polished Pebbles. And that is the next um, thing that we are going to be working with. Uh, she was waiting to see if a grant had been approved. Uh, and it has. And so I have a text message from her today saying, uh, you know, call me so we can begin this. But that would not be at a cost. Thank you. Um, so, no, we're not leaving the girls out at all. Uh, Ms. Alexander, you had a question? Yes, I do. Thank you, Madam President. Dr. Jackson, I simply wanted to ask, I heard you say that there were uh, 27 boys that were participating. Is it all boys in seventh and eighth grade, or was it a um, application process? Like, what was the selection for them? Ms. O, what was the selection for the boys for seventh and eighth Good evening. So all the boys in grade eight were were um, invited to this. And then when he came in and he spoke, we had some seventh grade boys that would like wanted to join. And so they joined as well. Okay, thank you. So it's a combination of seven. Well, it's eight. mostly eighth grader and there's six seventh graders. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? No, sir. Okay, can we have a roll call? For President Griffin? Yay. For Member Alexander? Yay. For Vice President Hanna? Yay. For Member Dawson? Yay. For Member Morris? Yay. For Secretary Taylor? Yay. For Member Williams Wolford? Motion passes. Moving on to the Board President report. My what was covered in my report was basically when I did the part on community engagement. There is nothing further. Next, the superintendent report. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And um, as we know, and we have been also making sure that in our admin team that we are also abiding by this uh, that was delivered during the board retreat. And so we have it as well that we can only stand uh, if we're strong together and supporting one another. First, I would really like to spotlight this evening our second grade teacher, uh, Mrs. Brianna Blake Brown. And she came to us as a uh, substitute teacher. She already had her bachelor's degree, uh, wanted to go into teaching. She's gonna talk about her journey but I'm spotlighting her because of her commitment, her perseverance, and never, ever, ever uh, quitting. This has been uh, a journey. And after she completes that, I'll talk to you a little bit about uh, what Dr. Betts and I are doing uh, to further this cause. Thank you. Can you guys hear me? <laughs> Good evening, Lindot family and Board of Education. My name is Mrs. Brianna Blake Brown and I'm the second grade reading and social studies teacher here at Lindop. I am also the co-teacher for math and science. I've also started coaching basketball for girls. Please bear and lend me your ear as I need to read my presentation because I don't want to leave out any of my wonderful experiences here at Lindop. As Dr. Jackson stated so nicely, I want to share my journey of becoming a teacher. When I first began at Lindop in 2019, I was a paraprofessional for the third grade team. Two months later, I was entrusted to be a long-term sub for a teacher who left for maternity leave. This experience was eye-opening and a confirmation to myself that if I can sub for a classroom, then I can handle my own classroom. Before the 2020 school year ended, myself and the third grade teacher, Ms. Triplett, decided we were going back to school to receive our master's. When reflecting on this journey, I think about how much fun I had when I received my first classroom. I think about the projects I was doing online with students um, and then in person. I think about how grateful I am that Lindop has yet again entrusted me with another important position. And when becoming a teacher, there is only one thing that you're considered to be enough um, or certified, and that is the content test. This test was the only thing that almost stopped me from becoming a teacher. Did you know on average, only one in four African-Americans passed the content test on the first try? 
Did you know that it took me five times to pass this test? Yes, five. Each time I went to take the test, there was a different experience. While in school, I had a professor tell me, you know, Bree, you're good in class, your papers are good, but I hope you're good enough to pass the content test. I remember the first time I took the test, how uncomfortable I was at the testing site. It was noisy, I was searched, um, I was asked to remove my jury. The second time I took the test, the instructor at the site um, said, you know, I've given out so many not passed today. I sure hope you're gonna be different as if this was motivation, but this was my reality. The third time I took the test, I failed yet again. <laughs> and when I took the test the fourth time, I realized I, and I realized I hadn't passed, the first person I called was Dr. Jackson. And I told her, I said, Dr. J, I think I have to resign. I can't teach at Lindop anymore. And she said, well, why would you say that? <laughs> I'm like, because I've taken this test four times and I cannot pass it. And ultimately the content test is what makes you certified. Um, you can have your undergrad in education and sociology, but if you don't have that content test passed, the state does not consider you a teacher. Um, I told her, I don't think teaching is for me. <laughs> um, I was like, I'm gonna pack up my stuff in my classroom. And I remember her words verbatim. Um, she said, Brianna, Brianna, teaching is for you. It's been for you since you came to Lindop. This test does not define you. And I think I really needed to hear that last, that last sentence, that the test didn't define me. I think there's a lot of tests I've went through in my life, but this test specifically, it made me feel like, like I can't get it. Like, it's not for me if I can't pass it. Um, this conversation really gave me hope because all I knew was did not pass, which in layman's terms meant not certified. As I stated before, this test made me question myself as a test taker and most importantly, as an educator. After passing on my fifth time, one thing that I realized as an educator is that it is my duty and sole purpose to give my students assessments and curriculum that can be accessible to all of them. I cannot assume that because the student is attending LINDOP that they've had the same exposure that their peers have had. This doesn't mean I will lower my expectations for my students. However, this test has taught me the range of knowledge expectations that I should have for my students. Overall, this process has taught me to never give up and stay focused on my goals. Yes, I felt discouraged knowing that my peers passed while I was still in my waiting season. However, having to take this test so many times slowed my thinking down as an educator and it gave me a new outlook on success. A lot of times when we hear about success, you hear about people saying, oh yeah, it took me one time, I did it. Oh, it took me two times. And that was my reality. My friends, Ms. Triplett, um, the cohort that I started in, it only took people two times to pass and they were good. That was not my reality. It took me more than once, more than twice. It took me five. Um, meaning I very well may hear several no's before I hear that final yes. But what matters the most and what is at the forefront that I keep reminding myself is that I did not quit, I did not give up. Um, I seeked other outside help because I was determined to not only pass, but to prove to myself that I am more than capable of becoming a teacher and that I am enough. This test didn't define me and it doesn't define my intelligence. To my Lindop family, to Dr. Jackson, to the Board of Education, I wanna thank you guys for encouraging me, for speaking life into me, for entrusting me with your children every day um, and never letting me fail, never letting that be an option for myself. Um, being at Lidnop has been a joy. Being at Lidnop has been a joy. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just so grateful. Uh, I think about my other friends at other schools they don't have a superintendent like Dr. Jackson. They don't have a, a board of education so focused and so determined to make sure that their teachers pass and excel and don't give up. So excuse me if I'm a little emotional because 
this testament, it was something personal to myself, but I had to prove to my students, like I'm staying here and I'm gonna stay here for you, but I'm gonna stay here for me, but I'm really gonna stay here for you. So um, I'm gonna wrap it up before I get all teary eyed and ask as many questions, but being at Lindop has been a joy and I am excited for the years to come. Thank you, Dr. Jackson, for never giving up on me. Thank you to the Board of Education for always entrusting Dr. Jackson and entrusting me, essentially. Um, and thank you to my Lindop family. <laughs> That's all. Thank you. I would like to personally say thank you for sharing your journey. And we as a board are so proud of you, especially the things that we've heard that you've accomplished since being here, Thank which you. is nothing but outstanding. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hunt. All right, Ms. Blake Brown. <laughs> well, guys, excuse me, but this is my baby speaking. Yeah. And my baby loves you, Ms. Brown. All right, baby, what's your teacher's name? Ms. Brown. So who was that? <laughs> Ms. Blake, she got married, daddy. Oh, okay, Ms. Brown. <laughs> All right, but my baby loves you, Ms. Brown, and thank you for everything that you're doing for not only Anaya, but the entire her entire class. Like, um, man, she was on the, you know, that path last year. Yeah. <laughs> but she didn't got in your classroom and you have definitely and opened up a whole nother young lady. And thank you for everything that you do, not only for her, but for her peers as well. Thank you. You rock. Thank you. I want Any further comments or discussions? Uh Ms. Alexander. Good evening, Ms. Blake Brown. Hi, Ms. I want to let you know that I am so proud of you. One, for your courage, your tenacity, mm -hmm. but I also want to let you know I want to thank you for your transparency this evening. Yes. I want to thank you for your commitment to our Lindop children, but I really want to just acknowledge you and thank you for being a great asset to the Lindop School District and the family. Thank because you. I feel we are a family here. I know one of my children, you know, had you and you were amazing. Oh, both. Both. Both of my children did have. I you. subbed for Jordan and I taught Kobe was my first you class. And, and I want to say that to everyone publicly, um, it was in one of the toughest times. It was the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I really um, felt that you did a wonderful job just navigating uh, at that time, because I know it was a new uh, arena for many people with e-learning and things like that. But to hear your story, um, I'm, not, I'm not shocked at how you were able to just navigate. And I definitely want to just publicly thank you. And I want you to keep up the good work because a lot of the children, they definitely look up to you and they admire you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, Ms. williams Walter. I echo similar, similar sentiments that my... Um, Colleagues have shared, but I also want to say congratulations to you. Thank you. It's not easy, but congratulations. Oh, exactly. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Dr. J. Hey. Uh, Mr. Morris. Oh, I'm so you sorry. Know, that's okay. But you know, when you was talking about just the encouragement, you know, my heart started beating fast because when I was coaching basketball here, we won so many games to the people came to Dr. Jackson and told her that we were teaching the kids bad habits because we <laughs> was winning by so many points. But to get to my point, they came back and said, hey, do those guys have coaching certificates? And we didn't have them. Uh -uh. So I said, you know what? Let me take this test. I took that test once, twice, three times, four times. I told Dr. Jackson, I'm not going to take this test no more because I'm not going to do this. And then Josh walked in the room and he pulled out the book and just to encourage me, he like, you got to pass this test mm -hmm. because if I don't pass this test, now I can't coach these kids. So was it for me or is it for the kids? Yeah. And I passed that test. Yeah. You know, you know so I, I feel that. I feel that. Thank you. Good job. Nice. Dr. Jackson. And so um, now the, the next part of this is uh, Dr. Betts and I working uh, with the legislators to make sure that we have this with an even uh, playing field. I know last year we talked about her being on the IAR uh, writing committee with the items and everything, and we just 
okay, Dr. Best, sort of hold it in because she gets fired up about it uh, and not get kicked off of there because we do need her voice at the table. But one of the first things that she asked was, on this committee, we're evaluating these questions, but we have not one person of color at the table with us. And so that is the work um, that we're doing. And we will probably be meeting with Senator Lightford soon. Uh, she's over the education committee, but also to be able to talk about how we can make this more equitable for everyone. Thank you. Okay, next we have our- Oh, next is the, uh, uh, next oh. is our spa day that we had. Uh, so when we came back on January 9th, we had an uh, e-learning day for students and we just wanted to make sure that the adults in the building were healthy. Um, so much pressure. And as we're talking about the 70%, there's pressure around for us all, but we wanted to make sure that we did something specific for them. And so we have two videos, some pictures, but then we also have two videos of the day just so you can see it. Uh, this was the first time that we've done this, uh, but this is something that is going to be uh, captured in every, for every year that we did to make sure that they, everyone is okay. Go ahead. Next, uh, we have our training for after school. And so as we will be uh, utilizing Waz Ed, these are just some photos capturing uh, them in Waz Ed. And Dr. Uh, Betts uh, was just so thrilled it's not thrilled a lot, but she was very thrilled because some of the teachers, they showed her some things. Mr. Novi is still here um, this evening, but also Ms. Boswell, and they have shown that they have gone even further than we could have even imagined and what was required for that little um, timeline. And so it's very exciting just to see them excited about it. I think um, Mrs. Boswell, she went, what did she do with the curriculum that you were so? So for the entire, for robotics and animation, but she went ahead and this was nothing that was required of her, but she went ahead, she flushed it out, but she also shared with her colleagues so that they could have that same information and did not have to feel like they were uh, beginning from scratch. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions or concerns? Okay, moving right along. Next, we'll have committee reports. The personnel committee, who consists of myself and Ms. Alexander, our next meeting is January 23rd at 5.30 p.m. The finance committee meeting, which is with myself, which is to be determined. Pace governing board meeting, which is Mr. Dawson and Mr. Morris, which was Wednesday, December 21st. Would you like to report on that? Yeah, um, so at that meeting, we talked about two big things. One, the, the audit was delayed, uh, but uh, it was on the fault of the, the auditor. So we don't have that full audit yet, but I have a report at the next meeting. And also uh, the refunds coming back to the districts will be delayed until March, but that's probably something that's already been uh, told to the superintendent. Mm -hmm. And our meeting will be uh, tomorrow. The next meeting will be tomorrow night. Thank you. Okay, next we have the safety SEL committee meeting with Mr. Morris and Mr. Hanna. Next date is to be determined. No, we got some dates. Oh, you do? Yeah. Okay. January the 25th and then March 16th. That was March what? 16th. Okay, thank you.
Next, we have the policy committee meeting with Mr. Dawson and Ms. Williams Wolford, which was Wednesday, January 11th. Yeah, um, Would you guys like to report on that? Yeah, uh, the majority of um, our consent agenda seemed like it was a lot of policy updates. Dr. Jackson, did you want to uh, speak out to one in particular? Or, or no? Were you referring to one? Oh, oh no, no, no. I was, I, okay. Before I went on, I just wanted to say there was, okay. Yeah, it was just a lot of uh, reviewing, but no major changes that we needed to bring before the, the board. Thank you. Um, next we have, oh, I show your next meeting is February 1st. Yeah. Uh, next para CIA meeting, Mr. Morris, Ms. Taylor. That date is to be determined or have you set it up. Thank you. Technology committee meeting, Mr. Hanna, Ms. Taylor shows next date is to be determined. Strategic planning committee meeting, Ms. Wolford, and actually that would consist of all of us with bringing that together. And that meeting date is to be determined. Community engagement me uh, meeting, which is myself and Ms. Alexander, um, that is going to be determined, which we should be coming up with something with that with the next meeting. Are there any public comments? There are none. Okay, thank you. Uh, can I get someone to take us into to adjourn to go into closed session? All right, for me, Hannah. All right, Hannah. I move that the board goes into closed session under five ILCS. 120-2 C1 and 4 to discuss the appointment, appointment, compensation, discipline, or performance of specific employees of the public body. Evidence of or testimony present in open hearing or in closed hearing will specifically was yeah, specifically authorized by law at 723 B. Cheryl Griffin, I second. Can I get a roll call? For Secretary Taylor. Yay. For Vice President Hanna? Yay. For President Griffin? Yay. For Member Alexander? Yay. For Member Morris? Yay. For Member Dawson? Yay. For Member Williams Wolford? We're now adjourned. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. Thank you. I thought we'd go into